Um, my key message I want to leave you with is that solar power provides energy, which most of you are very familiar with. But I will show you that we can also provide flexibility and capacity. And those are the three things that power system folks need. Uh, so we have shown, for example, utility scale PV solar contributes to grid stability and reliability. It can provide voltage control, ramp rate control, etc. These are the work that we have done in the past uh, to provide grid-friendly power plants. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, that utility scale PV plants can provide essential reliability services, which are also known as uh, ancillary services, and as well as grid flexibility. And finally, combined with storage, solar can also provide firm capacity. And uh, this is something that uh, we'll talk about as well. With that in mind, the solar can provide reliability services and NERC, uh, the many of you know, is the North American Electricity Reliability Corporation, have identified a whole bunch of essential reliability services that need to be provided in order to integrate higher level of renewables. And this is things like frequency control, it was mentioned uh, just a while back, ramping capability or flexible capacity. And uh, so we undertook a project with, in fact, California ISO, uh, some of uh, Guillermo's uh, uh, um, uh, fellow uh, associates at uh, KAISO, we, we took the, uh, this project and uh, it is published, you guys can look at it as well. And the whole purpose was to demonstrate how solar plants can provide reliability services. And, and the, the motivation of that is that if it, if it can do that, then it reduces the need for conventional generation to do so. In fact, if you want to replace all the generation with uh, solar and wind, for example, then unless they can provide this other capability, we would, we would be hampered in that growth. So this will enable additional solar and reduces need for expensive storage as well. So let me just uh, illustrate this by an example that we took and what you're going to see here is the actual real data. We took a 300 megawatt PV plant and basically, um, if this thing is all working, uh, we kind of said, hey, uh, in, the, in the daytime, this is the available megawatt. By the way, this is the megawatt that it would produce if it was not uh, uh, hampered in any other way. And then we put there a 30 megawatt of headroom. I know the, all this... Uh, uh, so text is coming out a little distorted. It is because of this uh, particular form factor of this uh, projection. Um, so we, we, we left about 30 megawatt of headroom. This was, of course, in fact, the question that was being asked. And so with that 30 megawatt of headroom, we then asked uh, Kaiso to say, hey, you send me your AGC signal. And that signal coming every four seconds. Uh, and this uh, line that you just saw uh, is what the PV plant produced. What do you guys think? Is it pretty good? Very good, isn't it? In fact, it is, uh, this is uh, 27 percentage points better than the fastest, gas, uh, fastest conventional generation, and that's gas turbine. Steam turbine, by the way, would do about regulation accuracy about 42%. And so these PV plants are doing in the 90% range. So much more accurate. And it's not a magic, it's not about solar. It is so much about power electronics. Power electronics can react really fast and that's what makes this happen. So the Kaiso and other people were very happy with that. And like the discussion that was asked about uh, the mileage, for example, so this would be uh, a high performance, high mileage kind of an application. Anyway, so the main point is solar can do that. Now, how about solar contributing to system flexibility? Um, solar, first of all, what we did was we worked with uh, Tempa Electric. Tempa Electric is an is a integrated utility, which means that they own the generation, they own the customers, etc. It's easier to deal with because then the contractual arrangements, etc., are not as uh, crucial. And they asked the following question. They are in, in Florida, and you, many of you know that Florida is a sunshine state. They don't have much solar, so they were asking the question, hey, can I put more solar? And if I do, how much solar can I put in in order to accommodate uh, my generation? They are about five gigawatt of peak load, so it's a small utility integrator, so we kind of studied that. We did a, a Plexo's five-minute dispatch for the whole year. Uh, including their load forecast, etc. 
So now the first thing we all started observing is that as you increase solar penetration, they were looking for 600 megawatt of solar in their five gigawatt kind of a system. So we said, if you take 1,200 megawatts, so twice as much as what they were thinking of, then even at that penetration, you have enough flexibility in the system that the amount of curtailment that you will get is approximately 1%. So 1% of the solar will cut. However, if we increase that to 600 megawatt, and you can see a dispatch profile at the bottom, which kind of shows what curtailment looks like, uh, you might get about 6% curtailment. Not you might. This is 6% of the annual energy, by the way. That's what I'm referring to. And then if we add 2,000 megawatts, you get 17% curtail and 2,400 megawatt. Now, remember, 2,400 megawatt is almost uh, like a, a 80 to 90% instantaneous penetration of their load at times. So that's why this curtailment goes up and goes up a lot. So ask yourself the question. I mean, India is nowhere near there, by the way. But as, you, as we get to the ambitious program that the country has, uh, certainly curtailment opportunity increases. So what can we do about this? Well, so here is where, first of all, why does this happen in the first place? So imagine that you have a load forecast of five minutes ahead or an hour ahead, and then as real time approaches, the actual load can either go up because it became hotter than you thought, or people turn on the lights, or it can go down, by the way, because, hey, some people tripped off or they didn't use as much. And so you need, in order for operational, and there are, uh, you know, Mr. Saxena and um, others are from NLDC, they know how to control the, the whole system, so they have to keep both the headroom to be able to operate a little bit higher if required, or the footroom to be able to push the f uh, generation down if required. So that's, the, that's how the normal operations work. Now on top of that, you add solar, and the solar, for example, if the solar forecast happens to be, uh, also has some forecast errors, so if lower solar generation than you expected, then you need more headroom. You need more generation to be pushed up, or if the solar generated more than what you thought, then you need a footroom. Bottom line is, you need headroom and you need footroom, in order to operate the system successfully. Does that make sense? Okay, I hope so. <laughs> anyway, um, so how do the operators actually do this? Um, so they start off a week ahead, and the reason they start a week ahead is because some of the thermal generation takes a long time to start. So they, had, they kind of forecast what the headroom and footroom require would be a week ahead, and then they keep going that from day ahead to hours ahead to five minutes ahead, and so on, and so as you get to the real time, as was mentioned by Guillermo, basically once you are like a five minute time scale, you're working with AGC, and that's all regulations. But rest of the time, you need certain headroom and footroom that you have to plan for ahead of time. And as you, as you get closer to the time, your operational flexibility decreases, because if you hadn't started that unit, or that unit wasn't running, you do not have the flexibility to ramp it up and down, but your forecast accuracy increases. So that's the, that's the, the, the dilemma that you're facing. So how, how do we do with this solar? So suppose, uh, and, and I'll just walk you through an example. Um, if you have this level of load that's kind of shown here, and you have a thermal generation, just imagine you're just a thermal generation uh, uh, portfolio, and you have some P-min. P-min is a, the minimum generation that you are going to push down, and so, and then you have an operable range, which is what Guillermo was mentioning as well. So as long as the headroom and footroom are within, are, or your load is within that, you are in good shape, and you can see the operable range is quite good, and so required headroom and footroom is fine, and you should be okay. And this might be a profile that kind of looks like that. Uh, again, I apologize for the, all the writing, this all <laughs> doesn't seem to come across, but this is a generation profile that's on a, on a spring day. Spring day usually is low load, so this is a load of about 3,000 megawatts. And remember how much solar I talked about? All the way to 2,400 megawatts. So now if I add solar to that, and a lot of solar, so this is my solar generation, and then the first thing that happens is the headroom and footroom increases because of the forecast errors. 
Now, the op and if you're on top of that, if you have the thermal operating range, it is no longer feasible because you don't have within the headroom and foot room. You cannot push up and down within that. Does that make sense? Okay. So this is not feasible. And so must take solar at that level is just too much solar. So it will look something like this. There's a whole bunch of overgeneration that occurs um, that you just would not be able to accommodate. So the way to fix that is by saying, okay, how about if we curtail solar ahead of time? And now I can push the, the P min down to the foot room level, for example, and then I have the operable range, and then the, the, basically it will look like that. So you have a whole bunch of solar that got curtailed because you need the, the flexibility from thermal to be able to accommodate that. Okay? Make sense? So if you look at that and you say, hmm, the reason this is happening is because solar is inflexible. How about if I make solar flexible? In other words, I take the thermal range, operating range, and make solar to be able to go up and down. Now remember, I just showed you AGC signal. We can go up and down as much as you wish, very quickly, very well. So if you combine these two range, now you can get a, what we would call downward dispatch, and you can actually uh, use solar as a dispatchable resource, in this case, downward dispatch, and you get something like this. Now, I'm sure, uh, I know the figures are a little distorted. However, if you look at these two figures, what do you think? Is the curtailment gone down? Yes? How many things have that it hasn't? Nobody, I hope, right? Yes, indeed. So now the curtailment has gone down even the, uh, just by how we use solar in the first place. And then uh, you, you can think about it a little bit differently and say, hey, wait a minute, I have this curtailed solar, which uh, uh, how about if I can use that for headroom as well? If you are a curtailed solar and you needed it for headroom, nothing to stop you saying, saying you know, just increase it. And if you do that, then basically you get a fully flexible solar and it indeed uh, gives you even further improvement in, uh, uh, in dispatch. So that's the whole picture. Does that make sense? All, it's, all I'm saying is that just treat solar as a, as a dispatchable resource and, and whatever it's supposed to produce, you can flex it. And if you do that, you can accommodate more solar and which is in general a better approach. And so here is a, a comparison of a dispatch profile over the year. Uh, what you're going to see is how this profile changes month by month because sometimes the solar generates a lot, sometimes not, and loads are higher and loads are lower. But this is the, overall the picture that you see. Hopefully the, the pictures themselves kind of communicate that the way of making using solar in this manner, especially under high penetration, actually gives you the benefit of that. So with that in mind, so flexible solar reduces curtailment. Uh, and, and so if you, so first of all, if you take just must take solar, we could go up to about 15% penetration, but then if we make solar curtailable, we can certainly go higher. But then if we make it downward dispatch, uh, it can go even uh, better, like this is kind of shown at uh, uh, that level where the curtailment goes down. And if you make it fully flexible, the curtailment, even at high penetration, goes down further. Does that make sense? This is for the whole annual year, yeah? And uh, so that's the story. And, and by the way, it also reduces production costs because suppose you are the integrated utility, you own all those assets. Every time solar generates, its marginal cost is, what's its marginal cost? Zero, that's right, its marginal cost is zero. So the, the more you use, the more solar you use, the less fuel you have to use, and hence your system cost comes, comes down. And indeed, that's the case. So as you increase more and more solar penetration, your, your cost comes down. However, once you start curtailing more and more solar, then of course the cost doesn't keep coming down anymore. And uh, so the downward dispatch solar will, re will continue to reduce your cost, and, and fully flexible will continue to reduce it even further. So the bottom line, the message is, Flexibility in solar allows you to add more solar, which in turn is a good thing for the overall system. And, and solar can operate flexibly from zero to all the way to available power. 
Now, of course, <clears throat> don't get me wrong, you cannot make solar generate anything at night time, so it is available power based on the solar irradiance, no doubt about that. But, um, and PV can start up in seconds, there is no reason, it, it doesn't have a long cycles for starting for like uh, steam turbines or combined cycle or, uh, or, or combustion turbines. And, um, and it can follow AGC signal with much higher degree of precision than can be obtained. So very good system. Solar can also provide firm capacity. And the idea here is that if you combine it with uh, storage, then it can provide you with a clean dispatchable generation. So we had a project where uh, the, the Arizona Public Service went, went out with a tender and this project was said, doesn't matter what technology you provide, we want this evening peak hour and uh, this particular project, which was uh, solar and storage, actually won uh, on, based on cost, only on cost, not on anything else. Uh, um, and uh, the, the nat natural gas turbines, by the way, are generally used for those applications. And natural gas in, in US is very inexpensive compared to India for sure. So even that was not competitive enough compared to solar and, and storage. And storage by itself was also not competitive either. So the idea was that you should uh, be able to produce uh, this, uh, this energy in the evening time frame. So evening being something like uh, 5 p.m. To, uh, to 9 p.m. or so, and in the months of summer. And if you were just relying on solar, then the amount of energy it will produce is kind of illustrated by the, the graphs there. It will be about 25% in that time frame. However, if we added one hour of storage, then we can get up to 48% of that capacity in that evening time frame, which is of importance. If we added two hours, we can go up to 72%, and four hours can go all the way up to 98%. So that's what, and, and you can see the, the yellow kind of shifting, which is like we are taking that energy and shifting them to the evening time frame and then producing it. So now you have a firm capacity as well. So the, uh, this is uh, certainly a game changer because if you can make a clean dispatchable plant that provides it at that kind of a capability, now it costs more because it is, storage is being used, so don't get me wrong, this is not you know, three rupees a kilowatt hour kind of a deal because storage adds uh, whatever its cost is and approximately what, eight, nine, 10 uh, rupees per kilowatt hour onto the, onto the generation that you have. But nonetheless, it provides you a firm capacity when required for that case. So the bottom line is that storage, uh, so we, if we have PV plant as a base cap capability, voltage support, ramp control is there. Um, power regulations, we can take care of power regulations, AGC, up regulation, down regulation. And with storage, we can have capacity firming, uh, energy shifting, flexibility, etc. So that's the overall picture. So in summary, solar power, can indeed contribute to grid stability and reliability. Don't let anybody tell you that it cannot control voltage on the, PV, on the plant. It sure can. And it can do uh, other things that are required for a, for a, uh, a grid asset as such. Uh, it can also provide essential reliability services. Back to the question about uh, how does one compensate for the, the reserve margins that you keep, et cetera. That's all an open question because that's an opportunity cost nonetheless. But if that is cheaper to do than by other means, make that economic choice, that's all. And by the way, if it is you are already being curtailed for other reasons, guess what? That all that power, all that energy is available to do anything else with it because it's already being paid for or it's already marginal cost of zero. You might as well use it for up regulations or other things as well. And finally, as I mentioned, uh, with uh, storage, we can provide firm capacity. So with that, thank you guys, and sorry again about all these fonts and things. It's, uh, we tried, but that's the best it will come out. Okay, thank you. Any uh, questions? Yeah. I just had uh, I mean, while you looked at production costs from a system standpoint, uh, what were the implications for the IPP? Uh, 
So you did mention at the end that maybe they have to be compensated for, uh, for opportunity costs for reserving themselves. But was that a consideration? Did you look at it from an IPP standpoint as to whether they are losing out in this process and they have to be additionally compensated? Was that added back to the system cost in a way? So in, this is, first of all, the, the, the study that I showed you was for Tempa Electric was a study. So the, the question is, and, and remember what I said is that this is an integrated utility whose production cost comes down when the solar is flexible. So the overall system wins, the overall society wins when we use it that way. So now the question is, okay, now I'm a developer. If I provide this flexibility, I have the opportunity cost. How am I being compensated? Is that the question? Yeah, yeah. yeah so I mean, that has to be worked out. But the, the important thing I want to stress is that as long as the overall system cost comes down, how that value is shared amongst various parties is a more about a market design issue and not about the technical capability or the inherent value to the system. Does that make sense? Yeah, maybe, but, but maybe it's because the capacity costs are getting recovered somewhere else in terms of incentives. In the Indian context, there are very few incentives actually being given to solar. No it's question. based on energy costs only at this point in time. That, that is true. So, so imagine as a scenario now when we are uh, getting higher and higher penetration of solar. Let's say we are at a 30% solar penetration and you are a developer and you are told that, listen, uh, you know, we'd love to get you to provide this solar, but by the way, you may get curtailed 30% of the yeah, time. That scenario, yes. yeah? that if, you, if I tell you that, then you will say, wait a minute, if that's the case, then instead of uh, three rupees, I'm going to charge you three yeah. divided by 0 0.7 and I'm fine. The society would win if I tell you that, listen, you will get your revenue as you were getting before, but that curtailment, I will use it for other value system. Now the whole system actually got more, more efficient, right? So, so we have to start thinking about that, I'm just suggesting. Yes. Good afternoon, sir. My question is like uh, you said, um, flexible solar generation will uh, decrease the need of storage, uh, right? Correct. Uh, That's right. Uh, mm -hmm. I have three points. Like uh, uh, first, you told that production cost will decrease, but if we uh, solar can generate uh, uh, some point uh, of uh, uh, energy, and I am reducing to keep it uh, uh, headroom. Uh, if uh, I am penetrating the less amount of uh, uh, energy from the solar, then I will be needed more amount of capacity to satisfy the same amount of the demand. So anyhow, I have to invest in the investment cost of the solar. Second, uh, uh, because I am keeping the headroom uh, aside, I have to provide some opportunity cost to the solar generating units. Correct. So, uh, so your question is, these are all economic choices one can make, right? So when you leave a headroom uh, on the solar, as I was mentioning before, you certainly have opportunity cost because that solar that could have been generated is not uh, extracting it's, value. Yeah. But what I said is the following, that you can use it for other purposes. If possible, again, if it can't be possible, then at some point you will say, fine, that's okay, I can still afford it. The, re, the, the, the message that I often give is that would we want to not add solar because 20% gets curtailed? In other words, should we lose out the 80% that will not get curtailed? What's okay. our aim? Our aim is to add more solar or to, as long as yeah. it's economical, right? I think your question was also related to storage. Is that correct? Yeah, because okay. uh, uh, solar is somehow uh, associated with the uncertainty also. And there is no uh, uncertainty point uh, uh, in the storage system. So anyhow, if we can provide the energy or the regulation or the flexibility from the storage, it is more beneficial than the uh, when. Um, so, so all the more power to storage. If it can provide cost effectively that service, terrific. Don't, don't, don't extract that from solar. In fact, that is the regulation that they are talking about right now is a 10% reserve for, uh, for uh, frequency regulation. And if you say, for example, hey, I can put storage and make that frequency regulation happen much more cost effectively, 
That's the path to follow, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. That's Thank what you. I would say.